It is my great honor to introduce tonight's keynote speaker, Dr. Heinrich Gottlinger. And I'm sure for the regulars and uh, people in the field, he needs no introduction, but we have some new people here, so I will take you through his life, abbreviated, because I'm sure he's going to talk about his accomplishments. So he obtained an MD and PhD from the Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich, Germany, and he finished his PhD in 1984. And until 1986, he was a research fellow at the Institute of Immunology at the University of Munich, where he worked on cancer. And in 86, he moved to Boston to the Dana Farber Cancer Institute to do a postdoc with Heseltin. And uh, in collaboration with uh, Sudrowski, he started working on HIV-1. And then in uh, 1989, he was appointed an instructor at the Dana Farber and then rose through the ranks and, uh, until 2004, where he moved at the University of Mass uh, UMass Medical School and uh, is a professor. And his first paper was actually 1985, and it was on... Uh, infiltrating mononuclear cells in human breast carcinoma. And um, his first HIV paper was in 89, and it was the identification of HIV-1 sequence important for packaging viral RNA into virions. And since that first paper, there have been hundreds of papers. In, and what is amazing, I've put just a few of them here, is how productive in a variety of fields Heinrich has been. And he's made seminal contributions in, I don't know, I cannot list them all. I think it will take me all night. But he uh, was one of the first to show that VPU has a phenotype on uh, particle release. He showed that P6 uses VPR to get into the particles. He showed that cyclophilin A binds to capsid. He show, uh, dissected how capsid and gag mediate assembly. He worked on budding. Uh, P showed that P6 uh, was very important for budding of HIV-1. And then uh, when the escort field exploded and uh, Several labs found TSG 101 as an important factor. Heinrich kept saying, no, there is more. There is more. And everybody said, no, it's TSG 101. No, there is more. And then one year, he came to Cold Spring Harbor and showed us a band on a gel, right? Which he would not name. Or rather, he named PIP. PIP 1 or PIP 2? No. <laughs> and then uh, later on, we found that that PIP protein was Alex. And I'm sure he's going to talk a little bit about that. And um, so, and several papers since. So I have to say that I first met Heinrich uh, when I went to interview in his lab in the late um, 90s, yes. And uh, I didn't know him then. I hadn't met him at Cold Spring Harbor yet. And I said, how am I going to recognize you? And he says, oh, I'm going to wear a very long scarf. I'll meet you at the train station. So I get off the train, and there is this light coming from the ceiling, and it was almost divine, pointing at <laughs> this guy standing with a very long coat and a very long uh, scarf. And uh, he was a very gracious host, and I enjoyed my interaction with him immensely. But I will never forget going around and talking to people in his lab. And they told me, you will come in the lab, and you will have left your Western blood films, again, we were doing films in those days, on your bench the day before. And you will come back in the next morning, and your gels will be missing. And then later on, you will see Heinrich walking around with a gel, looking at it, <laughs> trying to figure out, to interpret your results. And at that time, his great passion was Neff. And uh, as we discussed at the time, uh, with um, Paul, he told me, you don't want to work on NEF. NEF is a postdoc graveyard. So, but Heinrich did not give up. He continued to work on NEF. And then very, very recently, he identified the uh, factor important for the NEF phenotype, uh, SARING5. And perhaps I was wrong because his postdoc, Massimo, identified the same factor at the same time in his own independent lab. And that was a, a very exciting Cold Spring Harbor meeting. And he's actually been a very 
um, regular attendee here. He first attended the RNA tumor virus meeting, I guess, uh, so working on cancer in 89 to 91. And then from 93, he started coming here as a uh, professor, as a PI of his own lab, and has only missed one meeting since. So I asked Cosprey Harbor to send me some pictures of, God, of Heinrich over the years. And, oops, I'm sorry. And um, as you can see, I had a big problem. I couldn't tell what year was what. He always looks the same. <laughs> uh, but this is actually my favorite picture. This is from uh, 2015. And this is Heinrich and Massimo on Wen uh, Fei, uh, probably talking, comparing the results on Sering 5. So it's a great pleasure for me to uh, welcome Heinrich, and uh, thank you. Sorry, I forgot to add two things. I'm sorry about this. First of all, Heinrich is one of these rare people that when he publishes something, you know it's true. Oh, my. Second, for the new people, if he raises his hand after your talk and says, this was truly amazing, it was not. <laughs> I don't know what I should say. Well, thanks for this flattering <laughs> comments. Um, yeah. I think I learned that I shouldn't let people talk to the people in my lab. When they, um, yeah. Well, anyway, um, it's amazing how much I learned about my life from you, by the way. Yeah. That's uh, really amazing. So anyway, thank, thanks for, for asking me. Yeah, thanks for asking me to, to talk here tonight. It's, it's a real privilege. It's, a, it's an honor. And I think the greatest privilege of all is this, um, this uh, reserved uh, parking place that I happen to uh, unexpectedly have all for myself. Um, so, so when I started thinking about this a couple of days ago, um, I wasn't quite sure how to structure this talk. But then, um, I, luckily, I recalled uh, that I had gotten this, this detailed and really extensive guidance from, uh, from Walter way back. Um, here it is. So. <laughs> So, I don't know, what should I talk about? Okay, so I decided I'm going to talk about Munich. That's it. So this is from, uh, from above my, that university that you mentioned, LMU Ludwigs Maximilians University, Munich one of the top universities in the world. Well, not really, but. <laughs> uh, but, but it has a nice view, as you can see. Um, so in the back, this would be the Alps. And I have to admit, I spent quite a lot of time there while I was supposed to be at class. And, and somehow, <clears throat> I felt I can't, I can't spend that much you know, time uh, going to courses that I don't have to go to uh, because there was so much else to do. And, um, but I did, I did take one course in, um, in, uh, in genetics, I believe. And I think I, I took that course because it was at this location here, which uh, is a castle, which, is, which used to be in 1761, shown here, outside of Munich, but now, unfortunately, it's sort of engulfed by the city. 
Um, so this is where the, the, the kings of Bavaria used to spend their, uh, their summers, and I thought this is good enough for me. <laughs> um, so I took that course, which was here somewhere in a, in, a, in a side wing, and it was still a very splendid location. And I think it colored my impression of science a little bit, or, or research. I mean, it was, it was really a nice working place. And I thought maybe this is something I should consider. Um, and while I was at that, um, I, there was a talk over here, which I listened to. It was given by a certain George Köhler, which some of you might have heard of. Um, he got the Nobel Prize, actually, uh, for, and he, he talked uh, about how he figured out how to, um, how to make something that he called monoclonal antibodies. And that was really, I mean, it really fascinated me because um, um, I thought this must be a, a, a way, a new way to combat all kinds of diseases, including cancer. And, and that's why, oh yeah, and the talk was, by the way, over here, but it looks a little different today. It's, it, this, is, this is a long time ago. So they, they added a little more to close this gap here. Uh, he didn't have to give his talk in the open, really. Um, anyway, so, yeah, right here, or maybe not. Anyway, so um, I looked around for places where I could maybe do something with more than anybody, so I, I was really interested in doing a thesis. Um, and um, it turned out there was an immunology institute uh, at my university, and there were lots of faculty, apparently quite big. So I decided to go there, and conveniently the lectures were sort of noon or in the afternoon, so I didn't have to get up that, that early. Um, so occasionally I made it, actually. And, um, and um, so this course was given for medical students, so you didn't expect too much, really, from us. It was given by this gentleman here. Um, and I had no idea who that was, really. Um, anyway, I, uh, at some point, I, I approached him and asked him, well, whom could I talk to? And ask him whom I could talk to if I wanted to do a thesis there or in immunology uh, involving monoclonal antibodies, and he said, you could talk to me. Okay, so I looked him up, and it turned out he was the, the chief of this whole place, sort of like a department chair, and he was actually quite a big shot um, in, in, um, in this German immunology uh, community. And um, I ended up doing my thesis there, an experimental thesis, uh, which took me quite some time uh, to complete. And since I liked the experience, so quite a bit, I uh, decided to carry on in uh, Judy Johnson's lab, who uh, had come over from the US to establish their, uh, her, her lab at the same place. <coughs> and this picture, uh, which was taken uh, way later, um, shows um, both of them uh, on the occasion of Judy uh, receiving a, a medal uh, from the German government. And I assume this is a German government official, as I have no idea. <laughs> and um, might be a scientist, actually. Um, and I think it's called something like Order of, Order of Merit of the German Federal Republic, I think. And anyway, it's a great honor. And um, I have to say that um, this was a very, um, in, 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 <coughs> in, in a way, it was a very nurturing uh, environment, and I'm, I'm really uh, grateful uh, for, for mentoring, to them for mentoring me. And unfortunately, uh, Judy passed away a, a, a couple of years ago. Great loss. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, to mention a little bit, uh, actually, you already, you already told everything about it, so I can be brief, um, about what I actually did there, because there is actually a connection um, to HIV. So um, I was working on, um, in, in the form of CD4. So T4 stands for CD4. Um, so my, my project was really too, um, pretty simple. Uh, they had made antibodies against various antigens uh, that uh, um, they basically had remade them. They had the same, uh, same anti antibodies recognized the same uh, antigens that OKT4, OKT8, and so on recognized, 
but they had their own and we used them. I was supposed to use them to, to, uh, to characterize the, the T cell infiltrate in breast cancer sections. And um, so what I expected was to find some CD4 positive, uh, CD3 positive T cells and a few CD4 cells and a few CD8 cells. And they, all together that showed up to approximately amount of a uh, number of cells that had CD3. And because CD4 and CD8 were supposed to be subsets of um, uh, T lymphocyte subsets, characterized those uh, subsets. And what I found instead was an absolute preponderance of CD4 positive cells that had no CD3 on them. And that was really um, kind of confusing. And in addition, it turned out that these cells had um, something called T200, uh, is now known as CD45. And that is a common T cell, a common hem a hematopoietic uh, cell specific antigen. And then after a while, we figured out that there were monos monocytes of the monocytic macrophage lineage. We were a little too slow so to publish that, so we were not the first ones, unfortunately. Anyway, it turned out to be of some relevance later for the <laughs> HIV field, I guess, that monocyte macrophages have CD4. And the other thing that, that we concluded was that there was just a preponderance of macrophages in the tumor stroma. And um, up to this day, I think pathologists and everybody else in the cancer field is convinced that the tumor stroma is full of, is just made up by fibroblasts. So, um, but I think that's completely wrong. Uh, in some cases, um, macrophages are probably, <coughs> uh, there's almost nothing else but macrophages. So I think this is, uh, and we published this, well, more than 30 years ago, and it still hasn't sunk in. I'm still waiting. <laughs> um, anyway, so, so at that point, I wasn't quite sure whether I wanted to continue in science or not, but it was made clear to me that it would be a really good idea if I wanted to keep a foot in the door to, um, to spend some time in the US because somehow that was considered the mecca of science in Germany at that time. Um, maybe it still is. Um, and um, so, and it also turned out to be quite easy, really, to get a stipend from the German government to do just that. So after some consideration, I actually decided to do it. And I ended up in a lab of Mr. William Hazeltine. Uh, at least <coughs> it had something to do with CD4. It wasn't quite immunology, but so William Hazeltine, uh, I guess some of you might have heard of him. Um, so he was um, one of the, of the leading um, scientists in the world um, in the field of, of HIV molecular biology. Um, some would argue he actually founded the field, or at least he co-founded the field. I, he, they made very fundamental discoveries in his lab, like uh, transactivation of the HIV LTR. Well, <laughs> we, can, we can discuss that later. <laughs> um, so, so anyway, he was there from the beginning, at least if one, I wasn't there at the beginning, but he, according to Wikipedia at least. <laughs> um, and he stayed until the 90s when he left Harvard and founded um, Human Genome Sciences. And then he became quite a prominent businessman. And um, I, I recently found out that a Time magazine uh, listed him in 2001 as one of, the, one of the world's 25 most influential businessmen, actually, which is, which is pretty impressive. Yeah. So, um, so I was really a small fish in this big pond. And, um, but it was quite, um, quite a good match because in contrast to me, Bill was not a control freak. So he gave people a lot of freedom. And I, I, that suited me well. But, but he was always there when, when one really needed him. So for example, one day, 
I told him, um, <clears throat> well, you know, Bill, I know that uh, work is really important, but I need to go to Germany because my sister is getting married. And then he said, well, I understand that. You really should go to Germany because sisters are very important. You really should go. And then he said, well, um, sisters are forever. And, and then he added, not even wives are forever. So <laughs> for, for those who know him. Well, anyway, on the left here we see Eric Cohen, a very young Eric Cohen. He is unfortunately not here. Uh, he was one of the stars in the lab, so he had discovered, and I'm not sure, I hope you won't argue with that, he had discovered accessory proteins at the time, which I found really exciting. And I was hoping that I would work on something like that too, but from, it turned out to be wrong, that expectation. Um, this would be me. Yeah, I can dress very well sometimes. And I just wanted to point out the abundance of, uh, of hair. <laughs> but only from that angle, by the way. I have another question. <laughs> okay, so now this was my project, or my, what I was supposed to do. So I was supposed to work on gag, uh, which I found, well, of some interest. Um, <laughs> And um, so nobody had gotten around to bother at that time because of all these interesting uh, accessory proteins and uh, TAT, REF, and so on. Um, but, but so there was, it was a relatively open field, at least for HIV. Of course, there was a lot known about the gag proteins of other retroviruses. Uh, so I thought, basically, it's, it's predictable that certain modifications would be essential, like pr uh, proteolytic cleavage. And, and mercilation, for example. Um, what was a bit less predictable was the role of P6, but my expectation was it's just an assembly domain. So it didn't create a lot of enthusiasm in me that I was supposed to look into that. Anyway, so I have to apologize. I didn't, I thought this was my first paper, but unfortunately I'm wrong, as we just heard. So I, I chose the wrong paper to introduce as my first paper. Um, so this was what came from these efforts to, to look at uh, protease and um, mercilation. And <clears throat> it, was, um, it was actually quite easy to show that protease is essential uh, for replication. And I thought this is just too trivial. I mean, this is not enough for a publication. Um, I was pretty naive at the time. And another problem was, so I, 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 I insisted we need to show more, and so we changed other things like cleavage sites and bundled it with meristillation, which was also essential. And, um, and, and that took, took a while. Uh, apart from that, there was this issue of uh, electron microscopy. And um, so I brought my, my mutants to EM. And uh, they told me this is not HIV. So I repeated it, same result, it's not HIV. Yeah, and what do I know, you know? But <laughs> okay, and then luckily I read, I actually read the literature, <laughs> a paper by a certain Montagnier, Barry Sinusi, Montagnier in Science, and that showed HIV that looked just like this. <laughs> yeah, so the first paper on uh, the identification of HIV, they actually pro they looked like protease mutants. So then I decided we go ahead and publish it, and that was a good idea, I have to say. Um, so surprisingly, protease is required for HIV uh, replication, um, and gag meristillation is required for assembly. And a little more surprising was that when we mutated one cleavage site between capsid and um, SP1, we got these very strange looking uh, structures, and what we had really hit there was an assembly domain. Um, uh, it, it overlaps CAPSID SP1 or CAPSID P2, and we had later proposed 
um, that this is a, an, an, a region that has a, a propensity uh, for, uh, to form an, uh, assume an alpha helical structure. And, and I think this prediction has, uh, has been um, withstood the test of time, uh, and especially really beautiful work by Alan Ryan and also by Owen Pernullus, uh, I would say, demonstrate that that's actually the case. And, and again, uh, this had nothing to do with the fact that we mutated a cleavage site. It's this assembly domain that we hit. Okay, so after that, I, uh, I started working on P6. Um, so P6 has a, is sort of unique to these kind of viruses. So that created some interest. Uh, maybe there was something new to discover, I thought. Um, the problem with P6 was that it overlaps fully with the Paul frame, and if you make mutations, simple stop colons, you almost inevitably change the Paul frame, and that's why I came up with the solution to make mutations that change the Paul frame in the same way, but don't change the gag frame. Um, and the results are shown here. So the, the controls are here, so they don't do anything, so it, Paul doesn't, is unimportant there for whatever we looked at. But um, especially a truncation that removes P6 uh, turned out to make no virus. And if one truncates it, uh, there is less virus, and then there's this strange inversion here of the P24, P25 ratio. So the cleavage of capsid between, uh, <coughs> between capsid and SP1 is somehow uh, affected. So I thought, okay, it's a assembly mutant, just like I had thought. Of course, it's gag. And then send it to electron microscopy, and this came back. That's a scanning EM. And if one looks by transmission, it looked like this. So these are viruses, obviously, <laughs> lining the uh, periphery of this cell. Um, and that was kind of confusing because we didn't get any virus coming out, so I thought it must be a mix-up. That's obvious, right? And uh, I, I did everything again, and we did another round of EM, and we got the same result. Uh, so it was not a mix-up. And that puzzled me quite a bit. And um, <clears throat> eventually we kind of had to conclude that uh, what's, what's wrong here is not assembly, but, re uh, but release. Uh, so a very late step, and that was kind of a, an unexpected and novel uh, finding. And if one looks very closely, one sees that these, some of these uh, immature looking um, particles are actually still connected to the, to the surface by a, by a stalk, um, membrane stalk, which, which hadn't been severed. Um, and we now know, of course, that the reason for that is that P6 is uh, required uh, to recruit the escort pathway, a, a membrane fission machinery that's really ancient and is required to severe these, these bottlenecks. What's less clear is why these um, particles are immature, but probably it's for some reason they lose protease uh, because they don't bother the um, the pole might be cleaved in aberrant ways. Okay, so this reminds me to, oh yeah, there was one more thing. So we mutated some, some motif that, or I mutated to be honest, uh, a PTAP, and that was just because it's so conserved. And um, so I made two mutants, one mutated just that last P, that was a really good guess because it's not important, but I also mutated the penultimate P and the last P, and that induced the same um, release defect as mutating, uh, as trun truncating P6. So it kind of pointed to this conserved motif as being somehow important there. But it didn't really map it uh, conclusively. Okay, so this is to remind me, um, so what happened to this paper when we tried to publish it? So what happened was that, um, so I thought this, is a, this must be of interest. So I wrote the paper with some enthusiasm and we, uh, we, we submitted it to PNAS, waited two or three months and it came back outright rejected. And, um, and then 
eventually we got it in anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but I guess um, it, 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 a, a young investigator can be discouraged by that experience. And I just want to say, uh, if you have this experience, don't be. A rejection doesn't say anything about the importance of your work. <laughs> yeah. OK, so um, I guess I have to worry a little bit more. So then, luckily, oh yeah, then a couple of years, for a couple of years, I was sitting there, and people were, one by one, were proclaiming, well, this is all wrong. You know, there is no requirement for P6 for, for voice release. And then, eventually, there is the, this paper. Well, this paper was uh, 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 published. A really amazing paper in 1995 by Parent, Leslie Parent and, and John Wills. And this paper showed that not only that RSV has a similar uh, functional domain which maps to a completely different region and to a completely different motif, uh, but, but more importantly, or equally important, they showed that P6 can actually replace this, uh, this um, function. And also ERVP9, which is also unrelated, but we know has, a, has another late domain. Uh, something that, by the way, a, 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 um, a L domain stands for late assembly domain. It was a, 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 a term coined by, by John Wills to describe this function of the PPPY motif of Rosa comma voice. Um, and then, um, oh, maybe I, I guess I may have talked about was that the one? Yeah. OK, yeah. And then uh, I should have brought glasses. And then um, Eric Fried, <laughs> Eric Fried, of course, uh, mapped, um, mapped this function to the, uh, the PTAP motif. Um, now, this is my, this should be my introduction to VPU, is it? Anyway, so, so this, this is, of course, Eric Cohen again. And, and he, just to mention this one more time, he discovered VPU, I'm pretty sure about that. Of course, uh, Klaus Strebel and Michael Martin also discovered VPU. Uh, so we knew, and we knew also from the work of uh, Klaus Klimkeit and, and uh, Strebel and so on, that uh, just like P6, VPU was important for release. And we also knew that, that interferon alpha tended to block release. And this is, by the way, uh, a time when I still hadn't figured out that it's better for me to wear a hat when I stand outside uh, in Cold Spring Harbor. Um, so, so, so we looked into whether VPU plays a role and also whether the phenotype of these P6 um, deletions is, has something to do with, with interferon. And we f it f became clear pretty, clearly, uh, pretty uh, fast, quickly, that uh, the phenotypes are different. So the, the interferon blocks at a different step, the virus is, is, is mature, the virus that uh, is blocked if you don't have P6 is immature, and you can see this here, this double, this, is, this um, cleavage thing is, is different. Um, and we also looked at whether VPU might counteract A, the effect of uh, deleting P6, and the effect of deleting, uh, of adding interferon. So, and we concluded uh, it doesn't, because this is, by the way, the same gel as this here. It's just something is cut out. Uh, VPU did not overcome the effect of um, of interferon treatment, um, and that conclusion is, of course, completely wrong. <laughs> and and the only reason it, the only reason why we got to it is because we used we used um, we used Africa we used cost cells. And uh, of course, we now know from the work of Paul Bienach and others that um, the AGM, so AGM tetherin, um, is um, insensitive to VPU, uh, whereas a human VPU is, of course, counteracting a human. I mean, uh, HIV VPU is counteracting human human tetherin. Now, what we also did, we looked uh, at these cells by electron microscopy, and we saw these this massive accumulation of HIV particles in these in this, um, what looked like endosomal compartments. And if one looks closer, they look a little damaged, as if they were be in the process of being degraded. And there was, I could never see a budding, uh, a budding structure. 
So to me, that looked like maybe the virus gets endocytosed in the presence of VPU, but I, I was too timid to publish that because it sounded so outlandish to me. Um, and um, and uh, I still didn't understand what was going on when we actually uh, looked at VPU minus virus in uh, human cells. These are HeLa cells. And we saw the exact same um, endosomal compartments full of virus. Uh, there is a massive effect of VPU. So if you don't have um, VPU, you get basically no virus. And the electron microscopy shows that the virus is on, um, accumulating on the cell surface. Um, so we used it just as a system to test other things, like is this something that's specific for HIV gag or not, or is mucilation important and things like that. It turned out none of this was important. So here we have, for example, Visnavirus, and Visnavirus is very well rescued by inhaler cells by, um, by VPU, so re release. It's not released without VPU, and it's very well released in the presence of VPU. Um, and um, so it, this works for basically every retrovirus that we tried, including MLV. So we concluded that VPU modifies probably modifies cellular pathway, and we also suggested that it might overcome a factor that suppresses the retroviral particle formation. That was probably the best part of the paper, because it turned out, thanks to Paul, that uh, this is that's exactly what's going on. So you've got, of course, tetherine, which is countered by VPU, and if it's if, if VPU is not there, it gets endocytose, just what we had seen in the early 80s, but had not been able to put the dots together, I have to say. Yeah, so this is my last slide on VPU. Um, so at that time, I had begun to simply label virus radioactively and then just pellet it. I thought this was easier than, um, than um, <coughs> doing uh, immunoprecipitation or Western. And, um, and it shows that uh, protease is not important for the VPU effect. But more importantly, um, there was a band that I didn't, it was somewhat unexpected. It looked sort of like there was still a little matrix or some kind of in protease mutants. So we have the gag precursor up here. There should be really nothing, uh, no, no gag protein down here. This is a wild type virus. But there was something. And um, it was specific that turned uh, that was pretty clear after a while. And then Mr. Jeremy Luban published a paper in Cell um, indicating that HIV gag interacts with cyclophilins A and B. Um, now, cyclophilin A has approximately this molecular weight. It uh, couldn't have been B, most likely. It was not the right molecular weight and was also not in the cytosol. And uh, I had discussed this with, with Marcus, Marcus Tully, despite the fact that he had his hands full with other things at the time. And Marcus was all f uh, for going after it. He was really enthusiastic. And, um, and, uh, and then we didn't quite know what to do about it, but Marcus uh, once met Christopher Walsh, the director of the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute at the time, in the elevator, and he simply asked him who was working on, on cyclophilin, of course, and he asked him, by the way, whether he could have an antibody, and Chris Walsh said, yes, why not? Okay, so we did an experiment. Uh, this would be HIV here in lane two, and SIV, which doesn't incorporate it in lane three, and um, we used that antibody, and, and you can see it's uh, it's clearly positive for that band. So we identified it as this band here as, so this is just labeled virus, of course, and this is um, this anti-serum. So it was, it was really, Marcus was right. I was, I was really um, much more um, doubtful about that this would work. And, and the same is true if you use other viruses, so HIV binds, even HIV-2, we couldn't really uh, see an interaction. So it's pretty specific for HIV-1. Um, and Jeremy's work had indicated that it has to do with capsid, so we, we thought maybe we should show that, uh, that that's the case for virion incorporation as well. So we came up with exchanging the, basically using a, a MLV 
particles that had uh, HIV core. And, and that turned out to incorporate cyclophilin just as well as HIV-1 itself. It's also shown here. Okay, and um, yeah, and, uh, and um, Jeremy's paper was really helpful. It gave us lots of ideas, so what to do? The next thing we did is, because uh, Jeremy had shown that cyclosporins blocked the interaction in his, uh, I think, in vitro system between capsid and, and cyclophilin A, so we, we, we uh, did a similar experiment using virus, and it turned out that um, the incorporation of cyclophilin A was, was definitely blocked in a dose dependent manner by cyclosporins, um, including by a cyclosporin that had no immunosuppressive effect, uh, a compound from Sandoz. So cyclosporins, of course, bind cyclophilin, but they also bind calcineurin, and um, and then uh, the composite, this, this is what really blocks uh, the immune, uh, excludes up the immune system, and, and, and this Sandoz NIM11 did not <coughs> block calcineurin. Okay, and then um, again, this is shown by Mizan Andy serum. And then, um, so the really interesting part of this story was that um, this uh, inhibition of incorporation seem to correlate with an effect on the uh, ability of HIV to spread uh, in a replicative uh, system. And this seemed to be specific uh, because SIV was completely unaffected. And SIV does not uh, incorporate cyclophilin. And ultimately, that led to two back-to-back -back papers because Jeremy had similar results. Um, so we, we asked ourselves, uh, is this interaction, so what determines the, um, the, uh, the requirement for, for cyclophilin? Is it capsid itself or is it something else? And um, so we used the same um, approach that we had uh, shown you with MLV, but this time we used SIV. Uh, to, to transplant as a recipient for HIV cores, which was sort of a courageous experiment because uh, in this case, we actually depended on replica the ability to the virus to replicate. And that, I, I assumed, was very unlikely. Um, and it was difficult to do. There was no PCR. We had to do it all by cloning and putting in cloning sites by cytoimmunogenesis first and so on. So it's, I thought it maybe is a really a waste of time, but it turned out that thing actually replicated, um, at least in human cells. So this is a human cell line, a very permissive one. We deliberately used a very permissive one to give it some chance. And not only that, this virus, in contrast to SIV itself, was all of a sudden sensitive to, to this non-immunosuppressive cyclosporine. So that was nice. Um, and uh, we could do the same thing really by just changing a loop in the end terminal domain of capsid, which sort of sticks out and is now known as the cyclophilin binding loop. And um, in that case, uh, we also got replication and, and uh, that's actually, I guess the data are not here. Uh, but anyway, we, we, we got a virus that was sensitive to, um, to cyclosporin. And just to confuse us, if we only ex uh, replace certain parts of it, exchange certain parts of the loop, the virus actually became um, dependent on cyclosporin, which was a phenotype that Jeremy had also observed earlier, for I think for HIV. Um, so this is my was the conclusion. So we thought this is this is good. Okay, let's try this in monkey cells or in, in primary cells at least. So we tried it in in, in human PBMC. Used the same viruses. Uh, in part, uh, and even the one that had the entire capsid uh, of, of SIV replaced by an HIV capsid was actually quite capable of replicating even in primary cells, that is this one here, and it was sensitive to cyclosporin. But the real surprise came when we tried to do this in monkey cells, uh, rhesus macaques. So it turned out, not too surprisingly, SIV mark replicates in monkey cells, okay? 
However, that chimera, even so it's basically SIV and replicates quite well in human cells, did not replicate in monkey cells. And then I tried very unsuccessfully, or at least my lab, to, to do the reverse chimera, and we never got, we never got it to, to work. However, somebody here in this, in this audience did, Theodora and Paul, which is amazing, after having tried it for so long. And not only that, so we, 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 we basically concluded that HIV capsid is what restricts HIV in macaque cells. And, um, and of course, this is the target for TRIM5-alpha. Um, as Joseph Droski showed later on and many other labs. Um, I just wanted to, before I get back to escorts, I just wanted a, a, a quick story here. We also m ex um, were interested in matrix and we made a virus that lacks matrix, uh, inspired, for example, by work by Eric Barclays. Um, we also knew at the time that matrix is very important our own work and Eric Fried's work for envelope incorporation. Uh, one can rescue uh, incorporation in a matrix mutant simply by truncating a cytoplasmic tail of envelope. And we wanted to see what happens if we get rid of matrix entirely. And again, in this case, we only got rid of the most of it, like 90%. And you can see there is no envelope incorporation, but if you, if you truncate the cytoplasmic domain, there is beautiful envelope incorporation. So matrix is not really per se required for envelope incorporation. It's not required for particle production either. In fact, you get more particles if you delete matrix, probably because the Mirstil, um, the Mirstil, um, Mirstil, Mirstil group at the end terminus is constitutively, constitutively exposed. But I don't really want to talk about that. Um, so we, 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 we <coughs> didn't really expect that this would replicate, but we had some some mutants that did replicate, so we tried, we tried these deleted versions, and it turned out that the one I had ch ch shown you, which lacks almost all of matrix, replicated right away in empty four cells, as long as we truncated the cytoplasmic tail of envelope, so it could incorporate envelope. And then we got really in, um, um, ambitious and, um, and um, wanted to get rid of matrix entirely, and we did that by replacing a mystilation site with a SORC signal, and we created an artificial uh, proteus cleavage site at the end. And after some time, we actually got a revertent that replicated better than something that just lacked the cytoplasmic tail of envelope because we had to, we had to uh, truncate that uh, in order to get any envelope equation. So this was, this was really amazing. And, um, and we could even adapt that virus to some somewhat less permissive cells like chocolate cells. And I think we even got some replication in PBMC. So in other words, it's, 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 it's clear that matrix is not per se required for virus replication. Another thing, if one looks at um, in, um, by EM, the particles actually look very, very similar. Uh, I was always told that one can see matrix by experts uh, underneath, the, um, underneath the plasma membrane, but at least in my, to my eyes, they look, they look rather identical. The one thing that is different, so, is that um, one can even see envelope spikes relatively uh, equally spaced. Uh, what, what's different is that um, matrix as well as tend to assemble at all kinds of intercellular membranes, including mitochondria. So uh, I wanted to go back to escort. So by 2000, it had become clear that this PTAP motif binds TSG11. That was worked by Carl Carter. And um, then um, uh, Wes Sundquist had shown that TSG101 and escort pathway in general are essential for HIV budding. So this was really a breakthrough discovery. These were breakthrough discoveries. However, we had also um, noticed that, and I had shown you some data before, that if it truncates just the C terminus of P6, where there is another conserved motif, that the virus tended to be less well released. And we noticed also, or Bettina Strack and Ariana Kalista in the lab noticed that if one got the virus at, at the beginning, uh, regions that are actually not required for particle formation at all, by the way, for a wild type, otherwise wild type virus, um, it's really amazing how little is required, um, that all of a sudden even point mutations at the c terminal conserved motif made a huge difference uh, for the for virus release. And 
Um, then we used the construct, Bettina used the construct by Molly Akula, one of the her, her mini gag constructs, which I really don't have time to describe. But this is a, for some reason, they are L domain independent. So they have a Lucene zipper and they mark particles regardless of whether it's an intact L domain or no L domain. So we hooked up P6 and mutated P6 in this region. And it turns out there is a band here, these are radically related particles, that correlates whose appearance correlates precisely with this release defect that I had shown you earlier. And then we sequenced the band, and, and it turned out it's something called ALIX. Well, actually it wasn't called ALIX, it was called KAA01375, I believe. And uh, now it's called ALIX. And, the, um, and we had the right protein here because, as you can see, the, these bands correspond to these, so by Western. And not only that, but um, it turned out that, um, so the motif that the region where it, where it binds to in HIV looked a little similar to what by then was known as the late domain of EIV, equine infection univars, which is a, a YPXL motif. And so we tried whether ALIX binds to uh, that YPXL and it turned out, and by the way, the, the, the residue in red are all essential for budding. Uh, the other residues are not considered to be essential. And it turns out that binding, first of all, it bound extremely well, much better than HIV, P6. And secondly, binding, the requirements for binding correlated pretty well uh, with, um, with the requirements for particle release. So we felt pretty confident that we had the, the right protein. So what is, uh, a, a, what is ALIX? ALIX is a member of this, of this escort pathway. Uh, that also includes, of course, THG101. THG101 is an, an escort one uh, subcomponent. Then there's escort two, which is not so important for HIV. And ALIX binds directly to the business end, so the actual membrane fission machinery, which is escort three in humans, um, composed by a variety of CHIMP proteins, of which CHIMP4 and CHIMP2 are particularly important for HIV. So ALIX binds directly to CHIMP4 um, and sort of bypasses the rest. Um, and then downstream of all of this is a, an ATPase, which is also essential for HIV budding. If one, if one um, interferes with, with this machinery here with dominant negatives, I'm very proud of this, by the way. It's my own artwork. Um, I had to do this because the electron microscopy was closed at the time and I needed it <laughs> the next day. Um, so this is a this is what happens, shows what happens if one, if one screws up the escort three machinery. Uh, and was, this is to remind me that we were not the only ones, of course, which had these data. So there were uh, two more labs, uh, one um, <coughs> by Wes Sundquist, uh, a paper back to back with ours, and another that less than a month later, by the way, uh, by, by Paul Bienage, which essentially showed the same thing. Okay, so we still, we, we hadn't figured out a, a really convincing assay in my mind to show that ALIX is really uh, import, uh, important. We had some assays, but it wasn't, I wasn't satisfied. And then we did, we finally did this, um, the following assay. So we, we asked whether <coughs> um, an HIV that can't bind TSG101 is rescued by overexpressing ALIX as long as the ALIX binding site is there. And it turned out that this, work, this experiment worked brilliantly well. So um, as you can see here, the THG101, um, the PTAP mutant, it has the characteristic defect. It makes no particles. If one, if one expresses more ALIX, the, the cleavage defect uh, corrects itself as if it were almost as if it were a wild type. And it produces lots of particles. Uh, that was work done by Yoshiko Usami. I'm going to talk more about her in a minute. Uh, she also looked at the, since this essay was so clear, we looked at mutants of ALIX. It turns out, as one might expect, that the bro domain, GIM4 interaction is important. The ability to bind to GAG is important, which is mediated by the V domain. This is, uh, structure was all solved by Wes Sundquist. Uh, the ability to bind to P6 is important. So if you mutate P6 in a way they can't bind anymore, it won't work. And the PRD, amazingly enough, is mostly not important. So there are lots of interesting <laughs> interactors, but they're all unimportant, except for the very C terminus, and we have no idea what binds there. OK, so the other thing that materialized then was that a certain ubiquitin ligase, um, a net 4 like ubiquitin ligase, can also um, rescue these kinds of PTAP mutants upon overexpression. 
uh, that's shown here. That was originally also done by Yoshiko and, Wes, um, and Eric Weiss then took over and he showed that um, this works even <coughs> if one gets rid of most of this molecule and just um, um, it works uh, just if one retains only, only the hectomain is required as long as it can be targeted to HIV and we did this simply by hooking it up to a cyclophilin which of course binds uh, to, to capsid. So that, uh, that is enough to, to rescue a, a PTAP mutant. And of course it was suspected or basically shown by Paul and others that uh, these kinds of NET4 ubiquitin ligases um, uh, have something to do with PPXY later means like RSV and so on. Um, but it wasn't, it's maybe still not entirely clear. I should, probably should follow the literature more, but anyway, we did, we did an experiment to, to just see what, what might be going on, how, how actually these um, NET4 ubiquitin ligases um, um, recruit, escort, and what, what they recruit. So we used, uh, an, again, a uh, a late domain independent gut coxtern simply hooked up RSVP2B, which has the late domain, or a mutant which lacks a tyrosine. That's the only difference. So a tyrosine to glycine change. And you can see that there's ubiquination of GAG as long as the late domain is intact, and it's no longer ubiquinated if the late domain is mutated. And we just uh, compared these viruses by proteomic analysis. It turns out what they recruit is exactly one ubiquitin ligase, namely itch, at least in, in 293 T cells. And then they recruit lots of escorts, uh, escort zero, TSG 101, ALIX, and, uh, and an ALIX relative. So the, basically what we think is going on that the later mains differ only whether they directly recruit TSG 101 and ALIX or whether they recruit it indirectly uh, through uh, ubiquitin chains really, which may or may not be associated to, uh, 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 attached to GAG. And we think that these ubiquitin chains have to be K63 linked for all kinds of reasons um, that I don't have time to go into. Just how this might work, how the decision might work. So we collaborate a lot with Winfried Weissenhorn. Uh, we have quite a number of papers, like the, uh, the first structure of an escort uh, three component, for example. Um, I'm also on this science paper for some reason. I didn't do much really, but it's a nice paper, so I decided to show you something. So what, what, what Winfried found is that there are, uh, that certain chimp, activated chimp, two chimp three uh, molecules can form copolymers, and interestingly, they, are, they have this dome-like structure on one end, and that suggests this model here, that basically this dome brings them, and, and, and the membrane binding sites are on the outside of this dome. So the, they might just, the stone might just bring the membranes into close apposition and thereby close, uh, in, initiate membrane fission. So now I want to change to, in the last four minutes, to syrinx. Um, so this here is Massimo Pizzato. You may have, I mean, you may have seen him here. Um, this is um, Victor Garcia, and um, this is a, a meeting in which pink shirts were all the rage. Uh, <laughs> This is what was, this was a meeting usually, uh, originally dedicated to NEF, but that was all, those are all the speakers that are left in the last, last time, <laughs> three speakers. So it's mostly about other things now. In any case, so Massimo actually was in my lab uh, in the early 2000s, and he, uh, he worked on NEF, and he found that we tried to see whether anything, um, and if we can find anything that interacts with NEF, um, he he noticed a band under certain detergent conditions, which we called P200 initially, that band turned out to be dynamine 2, an endocytic fission factor, which kind of makes sense because NEF downregulates a lot of things. So we followed up on that, and it turned out that the infectivity enhancement function of NEF was eminently sensitive to dominant negative versions of dynamine 2. This is just sort of an illustration. If you make well, HIV in the presence of this dominant negative inhibitor basically is non-infectious. And, and there were other reasons to believe that. We did knockdown, uh, knock, knockdowns and rescue experiments and so on. So we concluded that dynamine 2 is important and maybe more generally uh, clatinimator and acytosis is important for the uh, infectivity enhancement by NAF. Um, so then Massimo, when he was, 
had his own lab later, he made a really interesting discovery, and that was that <coughs> cells that were infected with the retrovirus made virus, made infection, <laughs> equally infectious virus regardless of whether there was NEF or not, HIV. Uh, so NEF was no, no longer required, and he then mapped that to something called glycogag, so an extended version of gag. Um, that really has nothing to do with gag. It's an upside down, it's a type 2 transmembrane protein really. So what this, this N-terminal um, extension, which is uh, initiated by a non-canonical CTG, it, it provides a cytoplasmic tail and a transmembrane region. And gag ends out, uh, up on the outside of cells. So this, this molecule dramatically increased, in, at least in some systems, the infectivity of NEF minus virus, also illustrated here, without any noticeable effect on the biochemistry of the virus at all, just like NEF. Okay, so this was, this was interesting. So we were, meanwhile, looking at envelopes because we had, to our total surprise, found that the effect of NEF on infectivity depends very much on the envelope allele that one investigates. And um, so, for example, uh, SF162, so these are, of course, both uh, CCR5 users. Um, uh, SF162 is pretty sensitive or responsive to NEF, so it becomes much more infectious if there is NEF, whereas GLFL is not. And we could then map that to um, the apex of the trimer, in this case, actually, to the V2 domain. So if we exchange the V2 domains, then all of a sudden GLFL behaved like SF162 and vice versa, by the way. And interestingly, the same happened when we, when we used a glycogag in, instead of NEF. So we thought that means all kinds of things, and in particular means that NEF and glycogag do the same thing. And since we also knew that endocytosis is important, we also knew that the, uh, the effect of, uh, of, of glycogag needs AP2. Um, we, we, um, we, we were sort of working under the assumption that both downregulate a factor on the subsurface um, that needs to be endocytosed, and if it's not, it, um, it may get into the virus and, and poison the virus. And this is just to, to show that the determinants uh, for NEF's responsiveness are really at the apex of the trauma. So anyway, based on the model that I just um, outlined, we um, started to, to sequence, uh, to, to look for something that might be incorporated into HIV variants only in the, presence, only in the absence of NEF, but not in the presence of either uh, uh, NEF or glycogag. And uh, we did this many times. It was actually quite painful, required a lot of fiddling around and things like that. And eventually we came up with this here, Syrinx 3. So that was the only candidate. So it better be the right one. And um, it turned out, well, almost. Um, so syrinx are multipass transmembrane proteins, very conserved, poorly studied, five family members. Um, we struggled for a while to convince ourselves that syrinx 3 is somehow affected by NEF because we couldn't see the protein. And the reason for that was that we all spoiled the samples. So if you boil them, NEF and uh, syrinx 3 ends up right here at the gel. It basically doesn't run in. This is really the, the, the stacking gel here. What we could see is those breakdown products. So we knew NEF does something because we could see effects on the breakdown products. But we could never see the protein. And then finally we figured out how to see it. Uh, so here, these are the, con the right conditions. Once we had that, we could actually convince ourselves that NEF protect, uh, prevents the incorporation of, of, of syrinx, syrinx V, into, into virions. The problem was, though, that there were two NEFs which didn't. There wasn't a problem for this one because it's inactive, but this one is actually active, so that was a concern. And then we looked at other syrinx, and it turns out that syrinx 5 is um, also uh, equally affected by, by NEF. And um, syrinx 5 has a very strong effect on the infectivity of NEF minus virus if one overexpresses this in contrast to syrinx 3, which has a relatively minor effect. Uh, syrinx 5 has, and that was very pleasing, not much of an effect on VSV pseudotypes, and that was, that was good, for <laughs> good because uh, VSV pseudotypes were known to be uh, not require NAF for optimal infectivity. 
uh, then you and Fei Wu, uh, she uh, made knockouts. So we had, we had done knock, knockdowns, which actually almost conclusively proved that the Syrinx are the, the real culprits here. But we, we also made knockouts, and it turns out, <coughs> so we, we also knew that even so Syrinx 3 has little effect if one overexposes, it actually is very reproducibly has some effect if one knocks it down between four and six fold. Uh, Syrinx 5, of course, has a large effect, but if we combined the sRNAs, we had a very large effect. And then we tried this also by knock, simply knocking down. It turns out this was reproducible. So if we knock down, if we knock out Syrinx 3, we have maybe a four to six fold effect, Syrinx 5 after 20 maybe, and Syrinx 3 and 5 together in the range of 100 fold. And if one just uses uh, indicator cells here, that can be visualized on the right side here. So it's a pretty, a pretty impressive effect. And um, so I guess Syrinx 3 has something to do with it as well. And surprisingly, at least for me, <coughs> even in, in um, Syrinx, um, even affect the replication of, um, of HIV, at least in this system. So we had here viruses that had either an NL43 with its own NEF or an NL43 with a C-type NEF. And in both cases, uh, the, the NEF mutant replicated poorly uh, in, in parental trichotaric cells. Uh, if we knocked out in double knockout cells, um, NEF was absolutely unimportant. In fact, the NEF manus replicated often better. And if we then reconstituted, we got, we got um, a pretty clear uh, a requirement for NEF. So if we reconstituted the expression of, of SYNC-3 and SYNC-5. Um, now we have done some experiments, uh, of course, um, follow-up experiments. So this works only if NEF can counteract uh, syrinx. It also works just as well with glycogag. So if we put in a small little piece of glycogag in place of NEF, uh, it, it will rescue uh, replication just as well as NEF itself. And this is to remind me that Massimo um, had similar results and um, I published them uh, together with us. Um, I guess I should probably come to an end, but just very quickly, one possible explanation is that um, for, for the, sharing, the difference of in sharing sensitivity of, of different ENVs that, um, that um, the, the level of envelope incorporation, um, this is 292 so it's not sub from 292 it's not really optimal, but anyway, you can see that SF162, which is, which is highly uh, sensitive to NEF is, is actually poorly incorporated also at the level of GP41 or also GP120. If one changes, exchanges the, the V1 2 loop or just the V2 loop, it becomes much less sensitive to syrinx or responsive to NEF or glycogag and uh, incorporation improves. For JLFL it's the exact opposite. Originally it gets well incorporated if one exchanges the V1 V2 loop or the V2 loop, it becomes much less sensitive um, it becomes much more sensitive to nephroglycocac and its incorporation is, is correspondingly decreased. I don't think the whole, that's the whole story, but at least it's part of it. And then just last but not least, uh, this um, antiviral activity of SYRINC-5 is quite conserved. Even zebrafish does it. What's not conserved is the, um, the um, sensitivity to NEF. So uh, rodents, uh, SYRINC-5s are sensitive to NEF, but frog serving 5 is not. And we can uh, sort of correct that, at least partially, by exchanging a particularly long loop um, in um, exchanging that loop between human serving 5 and frog serving 5, and that works vice versa as well. So this is my summary slide. Um, so what we still think is that, um, so if, if NEF, <clears throat> cannot downregulate syrinx, for example, because it's not there, or because it's a mutant NEF, or because it's frog syrinx 5. Uh, syrinx 5 becomes incorporated uh, into the virus quite efficiently, and then for, it's for some reason uh, what's blocked is, a, we think, is the, the translocation of the core, not, fu maybe not necessarily fusion pore formation itself. Syrinx do uh, also block fusion pore formation, but only at somewhat higher than, or at least efficiently, uh, than endogenous levels. And of course, if serine 5 is downregulated and shuffled into endosomes, then the virus is free to 
but without uh, be bothered by syrinx, and it is fully infectious. And finally, I just would like to thank my past and present lab members for, for putting up with me. Uh, I would like to thank my mentors, uh, the funding agency, agencies actually, and last but not least, uh, you for, uh, for being so patient, uh, even so I went uh, over one hour. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Um, I guess today we heard that it's uh, counteracting CPSF6, right? Yeah, maybe that's what it is. I, I don't know, frankly. I guess Jeremy could say a few words on that. <laughs> you want to come up here? <laughs> Next year. So what about uh, functions of syrinx and their um, involvement in serine incorporation and oh, yeah. single so lipid biosynthesis? Any hint that that may be involved at all in mechanisms here? Well, um, there are lots of papers that would suggest the contrary. Um, I think there's one. By I forgot, there was a recent paper that, that may have been by Kreuzlich, but I'm not sure anymore, that excluded, more or less excluded that possibility. And there are lots of other studies which also argue against um, uh, syrinx uh, having anything to do with, um, with li lipid biosynthesis, I would say. So I, my feeling is that probably that's not <coughs> serine incorporation or um, phospholipid biosynthesis is not involved in the, in the mechanism. It's also hard to understand how that would be, you know, why, why, where the specificity would come from because according to this paper, other serines that do not affect HIV also affect uh, lipid biosynthesis. So um, I wanted to ask you, do you what other functions do you think serine might have? Because I mean, it's <laughs> so conserved, right? And yeah. Well, I, would, I was hoping that I, if I studied the literature every day, I would figure that out. So there is a paper, you know, there is, it's conserved in, in yeast, actually. And uh, there is a mutant, a null mutant, but they didn't find a phenotype. So their plants have apparently five of them, just like humans. But nobody knows why, I believe. But it's true, they're very conserved. Yeah. Thank you. So the most conserved proteins for which there is really no function. So what about syrinx and other enveloped viruses? Do you think there are viruses outside the retroviruses that may well be affected by them as well? Again, I would have to defer to Jeremy Luban. So he had a poster today about other, other envelopes, and I forgot what amphotropic <laughs> marine... <laughs> I think amphotropic marine leukemia virus is, is sensitive. Ebola virus is not sensitive. Mm -hmm. influenza. I, our influenza virus is sensitive. And I think maybe xenotropic, I believe, xenotropic uh, might be sensitive. Okay, so let's thank Henrik one more time. Thank you.